Hi, I'm Michelle Sterling for Friends of Science Society. I'd like to talk with you today about aviation and climate change. It's uh, 91 years since my grandfather, Captain Robert Miller Sterling II, died in an airplane crash at the Hamilton Airfield. He was leading the Trans-Canada Air Pageant, the first civilian Trans-Canada Air Pageant. And people had rushed out onto the landing field because they were so amazed and enamored with his flight. And unfortunately, he pulled back on the stick to avoid running into the crowd. It tore the fabric on the wing of the plane. The plane flipped over and crashed. So I never got to meet my grandfather, but I do have a few things to remember him by. Some of his war medals from World War I, his logbook, one of his logbooks, and this was when he was flying in the Quebec area, and then later in Ontario. And I guess I wanted to talk with you about the fact that aviation has been used as a lever to take away many of your rights and freedoms during the time of COVID. Now that might sound like a rather bombastic statement, but that's my opinion. And you can look at the statistics and you'll see that about 4 billion people were flying worldwide as passengers prior to the COVID lockdowns. And you can also see that the World Economic Forum and the WHO and the UN have all wanted to have a digital identity for people to track what they do ostensibly to prevent the spread of diseases or to stop criminals from traveling internationally without restriction. But in fact, we know it goes far beyond that. Uh, one of the things that the climate cult would like to introduce to the world is a personal carbon ration. And there's been talk lately about how great that would be to put your personal carbon ration on your vax port. Now, many of the people got the COVID vaccines because they wanted to, again to fly. They loved that freedom of flying. And you can see that throughout history, just like my grandfather, and just like Jean Batten, a female flyer, an aviatrix, in the same era as Amelia Earhart. She used to fly her plane across Europe in the middle of the night, no co-pilot, no GPS, no cell phone, no night vision equipment, no, um, uh, no control tower. And uh, she always used to carry in her um, cockpit a silk gown because quite often when she landed, uh, they'd, they'd throw a party for her <laughs> so that she could dress appropriately for these parties where she was fetid around the world. Um, so we know that from the beginning people have loved aviation, they've loved flying. There are a few people who are afraid of flying, but they're not in the majority. Uh, and so aviation was used as a lever to push people into the vaccine program to ultimately arrange for you to have a digital ID, a vax port, and a carbon ration, a personal carbon ration. Um, now, of course, people who are concerned about climate change think that's a great idea. But if you look at the emissions of aviation, you'll find that they're comparatively nominal. The biggest emitter in the world is China. Shipping and aviation combined is a very, very small part of, a of emissions in the world. And in Canada, um, I asked Robert Lyman about it, and he said that, I think it was 2019, it was 0.8 of Canada's emissions, shipping and, and aviation combined. So that's nothing. And yet, groups like the David Suzuki Foundation are dead set on having an emissions, uh, aviation emissions management program. And like I said at the beginning, 
how is aviation and climate change combined? If you look back to, I believe it's 2019, Robert Lyman did a couple of pieces for us just before the COVID lockdowns hit. And they were about how uh, the powers that be were trying to force aviation companies into a carbon offset program. And the aviation companies were reluctant to participate because they were already struggling. Um, you know, they were already struggling with rising costs and many complications from all the various regulations that have been imposed upon them over the years, whether it be to, uh, uh, you know, control and manage possible terror attacks or whether it be emissions reductions or whether it be passengers' rights, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So airlines were already struggling and they were reluctant to accept this uh, Corsia program. Um, and so that brings to mind the statement that Mark Carney made when he said firms that don't go along with the climate change agenda will go bankrupt. And that's pretty much what lockdowns did to airlines, pretty much bankrupted them. So now they had to turn to government for bailouts and in many cases you'll find that in order to get the bailout they had to comply with various climate agendas. It's not consistent around the world, but you can look and see what it means. So I guess what I'm saying is that your trust has been abused. Your private information is being abused. Uh, your good faith and goodwill has been abused. And uh, your love of freedom has been exploited. And that's all by the lockdowns, which I must admit, in the early days of COVID, we probably, you know, were, were uh, right to consider a couple of weeks of lockdowns, perhaps a month, until something was known more about this virus. But the long-term lockdowns have bankrupted so many people and bankrupted the trust of so many people. And further to that, the airline industry is extremely complex. The numbers of logistics that go into making that precision clock work are absolutely incredible. And I, I was very proud that the aviation industry, 91 years after my grandfather's crash, had achieved a level of safety, incomparable safety, when you consider the number of people flying it was really an exceptional record. So incomparable safety, precision logistics, plan B. I mean, in those days, if you missed a flight, you could probably within a few hours catch a connection. There were very, very good um, options available for every traveler. It might not have made every traveler happy, but it was really incredible when you think about the volume of people and baggage that was moving around the world. So sadly, after the lockdowns were implemented, those precision mechanisms basically fell apart. And there is actually a very good um, description on Twitter by a fellow named Duncan D, who's a former chief operating officer of an airline. And he shows you, he goes through all the list of logistics that fell apart. You know, so people who are upset at the airport try and have a little compassion for these people who are running airlines who are now facing impossible logistical challenges and more ridiculous climate interventions. So, um, you know, there's a couple of uh, groups that have formed internationally, the Global Aviation Advocacy Coalition, uh, Free to Fly Canada, some of these groups have some very interesting and serious concerns about the situation in aviation, and I think it's worth looking at that and understanding the uh, risks that they're addressing. And I think that we have to ask a lot of questions of our policymakers and um, our elected officials about the freedoms that we've lost in terms of the lockdowns and the deconstruction of aviation. So I want to point the finger at the World Economic Forum because 
they're very happy about uh, a aviation being shut down. They think that the planet loves you for breaking your habit of flying. And Klaus Schwab wrote a book in June of 2020 called COVID-19, The Great Reset. And in it, he was thrilled that Zoom, a virtual communications company, which of course had been quite helpful during the lockdowns, had a market cap that was bigger than most airlines. So I just checked and Zoom has market capitalization in 2020 of $70 billion. And I think it was Southwest had a cap market capitalization of 35 billion. But Zoom employs about 2,000 people and Southwest employs about 55,000 people. Not to mention that beyond the uh, actual technical employees of an airline, you have this tremendous supply chain of the airline. You have the airline industry, the airline parts industry, and at the other end of it, you have the tourism and uh, recreation industries all around the world. The GDP of some small countries almost entirely relies on tourism and aviation. So Klaus doesn't think about that. He only thinks about his fourth industrial revolution, where you and me are going to become useless eaters, and we're all going to be replaced with artificial intelligence and robots, as far as he's concerned. He sees that as a victory, just as he saw the Zoom capitalization as a victory. He didn't see all the laid off people. He didn't see any of the human, emotional, and actual carnage of the lockdowns. And it seems that he's joyful that these measures are bankrupting society because he thinks that lockdowns reduced emissions and that we should do more of them. In fact, lockdowns did not reduce emissions by any measurable quantity. And after the lockdowns were over, the demand for oil and gas worldwide skyrocketed. So I don't know what we can do about the World Economic Forum destroying the lives that people like my grandfather helped build, but we better do something about it because their time is long past for tinkering in the world. And just remember, these are the same people who granted private jets the right to not have to deal with these carbon tax and uh, climate measures. So if you're rich and you own a private jet, you don't have to think about that. But if you're a struggling airline company, you're having your arm twisted to participate in all kinds of climate nonsense. And in fact, the truth is carbon dioxide is not the main driver of climate change. So why are we doing this in the first place? Have a look at our website and see what you think. We have a lot of climate science there, uh, climate policy issues. You can see Robert Lyman's various com commentaries on aviation policies. And um, if you can help us out, that would be great with a donation. We're in our 20th year now. We're asking for a $20 donation from our viewers. And if you can't help us with money, you can share our material. You can subscribe and send us a comment. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. We thank you very much for your support. And let's do everything we can to get back in the air and get our freedoms back for Friends of Science Society. I'm Michelle Sterling.